hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown and I'm here to do a baby Lisa, baby Lisa Irwin today. And yes, I'm wearing my Eastern State Penitentiary hat. That's what I visited on my vacation. It was the first place my daughter and my granddaughter who's eight went on our vacation. So you can see what kind of people we are. <laughs> it was great though. I wouldn't want to live there. Great place to visit. All right, let me see who is here. And if you can hear me before I keep going, Molly's here, Doreen is here. Oh, thank you, Lisa, who says you can see and hear me. All right. All right. Annie Haley is here and Megan is here. Uh, who thinks Pat will have <laughs> an Amish bonnet? No, no. You saw what I wear. I'm, I'm the penitentiary girl. You know, <laughs> I'm not a bonnet girl. So no, I bought myself a penitentiary hat instead because, you know, just because. But I will say this. Um, I really really had trouble trying to get this pr presentation put together, this show put together, because we spent two days in uh, Philadelphia and we were super, super busy. And then we went to Amish country into Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we stayed with an Amish family and they had no electrical outlets in the house and no internet. So I'm like, this is going to be very tricky to try to both do my vacation and try to get this done without the proper uh, <clears throat> setups. So it was really fantastic, though. I had a really good time. Uh, and they were wonderful people. And so we had, it was just so peaceful and, and lovely. No televisions, no radios, no internet, uh, and uh, battery operated little lanterns at night. And they were just super people. So we had a great time. So who else is here? We have Doreen here, Carrie's here, Lila's here, and uh, Christine, I don't know if I just said you already. And Heidi's here. And I'm going to, who am I running over here? <laughs> because we have a lot of conversations going on here. Molly's here. I might have said that already. Uh, Anne is here. And yeah, your, your family's gone home. I know that's sad, but I'm glad you're back. Um, and I already said Christine Florence is here. And what else have we got? I'm trying to run back upwards now. Just see who I've missed. Carolina is here. I think I said Doreen. Carrie, I think I said. I have no idea who I said now. Um, Lisa and would be here. Um, but, but Le wait a minute, Lisa, and why are you even here? You just said you had to go to work because I changed the time from, I changed the time from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. because about the time 4 p.m. was coming up, I was with my granddaughter learning how to make different kinds of ice cream flavors <laughs> in a ch children's ice cream place. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so then I had to move the, move the show. So anyway, I must have missed somebody, I am sure. But I apologize. Elizabeth's here. Annika is here. Oh, so cool. Everybody's here. All right. So enough about my wonderful vacation. I'm going to put pictures up on Facebook because it was great. Uh, we did so many things. It's ridiculous. Um, I don't know how we got that much into four days, but we had a great time. But now to baby Lisa, because it's been over 10 years. And uh, now it's been way over 10. Wait a minute. When did she go missing? Let's see. She went missing in 2011. So it's 11 years now. Uh, and the case is unsolved. If you don't know anything about the baby Lisa case, let me just give you, I'm going to give you first a paragraph and then I'm going to go do a kind of a unique way of approaching this case, which I haven't seen anybody do. So I'm going to do it. Uh, there's really not much out here on this case. It's kind of fascinating. You know how usually when you go to YouTube, you got like everybody and their brothers got a YouTube video, almost nothing done on uh, baby Lisa at all. Um, so just a couple couple YouTubers doing something on Baby Lisa. Uh, there's, I think there was one, maybe HLN show, maybe we got that wrong, uh, short show on it. And that's almost nothing. And one may wonder why there's so little done on this particular baby when so many other babies get a tremendous amount of publicity. Now, it's not because the parents didn't do television shows. They did. They even did Dr. Phil. So it's not like they didn't go public. But for some reason, maybe because the police have kept very quiet about this case, nobody knows what's really going on. So, you know, there hasn't been, there hasn't, hasn't been enough people to grab onto. So, oh, you asked for this case? <laughs> I asked for this case. All right, Doreen. Thanks so much, Pat. It sounds like it was a challenge. It is a challenge because it's easy to do cases where I can just come off and go, well, I know what happened. <laughs> 
This is not one of them. Uh, but I want to point out all the interesting issues about this case. And what's most interesting is this case has really only two suspects. We have Deborah Bradley, the child's mother, baby, Lisa, baby Lisa's mother, and maybe her husband helping out, Jeremy Irwin, or some guy. And the some guy that they think uh, that they're looking at is a guy uh, that they call Jersey. Uh, and he was a drifter dude in the neighborhood. And yes, he's got interesting connections to the case. So if there's anybody outside of the family that took baby Lisa, it would be a guy named Jersey. So you have two, basically two suspects, Deborah Bradley. And this is not necessarily Jersey. This is just some this is so. This is a camera that caught this guy on that evening, uh, coming out of a woods, and it looks like a ghost. <laughs> um, we have no idea who he is, and most. I think the police are basically gone. How about a guy who went to pee in the woods? You know, it's probably nothing important, but there is a guy running about who could be Jersey, who might have kidnapped Baby Lisa. So there are two suspects in this case. So, oh, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> Oh, thank you for saying that, Lisa. I almost forgot to do the spiel. You know what I mean? Why am I forgetting to do the important things to keep the channel going? All right, folks, keep the channel going. <laughs> Subscribe to the channel. Cost you nothing. But you get to see all my stuff. Uh, hit the bell. You get, you get the notifications of what's coming up. You can like this video and you can share in a true crime community. Or if you want to be in the chat room like all these wonderful people, uh, I only have the, the live shows are only open to people who uh, support me on Patreon. It's five bucks a month for eight shows plus other stuff. Uh, the idea is just to have a real good community. Uh, so please join that and join in our chat room. And you can also buy a book. Okay, that's that. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> okay, so now let's get to this case. And I say, I'm going to approach it. Oh, you haven't heard. Megan says, I've never heard of this case. Mm-hmm. There's so many cases out there, you'd be shocked after a while to realize how many, you don't know like 98% of them. So maybe 2% of cases get huge publicity. This did get good publicity at the time, but some something, for some reason, it just said, didn't seem to really take off like Madeleine McCann case. You know, that case has gotten massive publicity. Uh, this case, not so much. But I'm going to bring up Madeleine McCann, and you might wonder why. All right, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> All right. So now, because I want to show you an order of things that happened in the history of some missing children, you're going to find this fascinating because I don't think anybody much has brought this up. So now just to tell you basically what happened in this case, Deborah Bradley, Lisa's mother. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me start the right place on Wikipedia. Uh, the disappearance of Elisa Renee Irwin was reported after it was discovered that she was missing from her home in Kansas City, Missouri, in the early morning hours of October 4th, 2011. Please remember the, the year 2011. Deborah Bradley, Lisa's mother, said that Lisa's father, Jeremy Irwin, discovered her missing around 4 a.m. on Tuesday. In other words, he, she had been at the home, but he had been out of the home. He arrived home and found the baby missing. According to Deborah, Lisa had been in her bed when she checked on her at 6.40 p.m. or 10.40 p.m., and we'll get into why that time changed, on Monday night. Uh, she had been drinking. That's one of the reasons this had changed, and I'm going to get into the whole drinking issue. But when Jeremy came home from his late-night job on Tuesday, he discovered, quote, many of the home's lights were on, a window was open, and the front door was unlocked. Later, the family told police that several cell phones were missing. They had three cell phones that went missing out of the house, supposedly. So, at any rate, um, during the sub subsequent investigation, two witnesses were discovered who claimed to have seen a man walking down the street with a baby. Okay, and I'm not going to get into that yet. Okay, so that's the possible you know, kidnapper. And then we have, was there a kidnapper? Or did Deborah Bradley do something to her child earlier? So this is the basic setup. Um, so remember some of the interesting things about this case. We have um, the babies found missing from the crib. Uh, the father comes home. He finds all the lights on. 
He finds the front door unlocked and he finds a windows open and he finds a, the screen is pushed slightly in. So he says, that's not normal. Window open, screen pushed in. Now, hang in here with me because this is, this is going to be a little bit different. Okay. Now, that was 2011. Let me go back to the case of Madeleine McCann. Madeleine McCann went missing in 2007. So this is the four years prior to this. Madeleine McCann, a British child who disappeared on the evening of the 3rd of May, 2007, from her bed in a holiday apartment in Prado de Luz, Portugal. This is the super famous case where her parents were out drinking with her friends. Uh, they came back to the, uh, the vacation flat where they had left their three children. Two children were still there. Now pay attention to how many children were still there. Two children were still there, but Madeline, the almost four-year-old, was missing. They claimed, the mother claimed that when she came in, the windows had been pushed open, the shutters had been tampered with, and she believed somebody came in through that window and took her daughter away. Still missing child, Madeline McCann, 2007. All right. Now, hang with me here and try, try, to, try to stay with me through this interesting next part I'm going to tell you. And you're going to wonder why I'm telling you these, these stories, but this leads up to what happens with baby Lisa. So now, so, <clears throat> all right. So in 2000, what did I just say that date was? <laughs> I should know this. I worked this case. <laughs> okay. May of 2007 over in Portugal, Madeline McCann goes missing. May of 2007. Now fast forward to August, September of 2007. I'm going to, there's a reason that they don't quite know August or September. So just, okay, 2007 still, May, June, July, August. So three to four months later, just three to four months later, wait to hear this case. And let me put up the little baby picture here. All right. Um, this is the case of, here she is, this little girl. Her name is Harmony Jade Creech. Cute little girl. All right. That's a little girl. All right. So her mother was Johnny Michelle Hauser. She was 25 when she brought Harmony into this world in 2006. While Harmony's father, this is Harmony's daddy. All right. Ronald Creech was deployed in Iraq. Everyone who knew Harmony loved her immediately. She was said to be adorable, blah, 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 because we all love the babies. Everybody says that. Ronald, the, 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 the uh, gentleman in the picture, only got to see his daughter for two weeks when he was home on leave, and then he went back to Iraq. Returning home on October 19th, 2007, Ronald found that the crib he wanted to find his daughter in was empty. Okay, so he comes home. Now, mind, mind you, <laughs> that Madeline McCann's parents came home from drinking and walked into the vacation flat. You know, they've been gone for, they claim, just a half an hour or so. But, hey, you know, we're not so sure that, but they've been drinking. They came back and found missing, uh, Madeline, Madeline missing, Madeline missing from the, from the flat. Okay? With a window, a jar. Okay. This guy comes home from Iraq <laughs> a really long way and finds his daughter missing out of the crib. Now listen to this next part. Harmony's bedroom window screen had been propped, pop, no, sorry. <laughs> Let me speak clearly. Harmony's bedroom window screen had been popped out. Does that sound familiar? And the window was open. We have a lot of problems with windows being open and children disappearing out of them. And much of her clothing was found to be missing. An Amber Alert was issued immediately. Johnny, that's the mother, said she had last seen her daughter the night before at about 11 p.m. in her crib. Harmony was only 11 months old and weighed about 18 pounds. There were three other children in the home that night, all under the age of five. None of them were taken and none seemed to have been harmed. So here we again, we have the Madeline McCann case. we got the two older, uh, sorry, the two younger siblings in that case and Madeline. Then in this case, we have three, three slightly older siblings. And then we have 
three, right? Yeah, and then we have the, the 11 month old baby who was taken and the other children are fine. Pictures of Harmony were distributed and many cars were stopped at checkpoints to see if she was inside them and they, they couldn't find anybody. At one point, someone decided to check the attic of the home just in case. What they found was horrifying. The remains of Harmony were found with her little body having been stuffed inside a plastic bag and then put into an empty diaper box. And the date on that diaper box was January 20, 20, 20 2007. All right. So the, 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 the autopsy reports weren't good. Uh, they, had, they had her with advanced stages of starvation and nicotine in her system and all horrifying. Johnny said that she had found Harmony dead in her crib this is this is the later story. Johnny, after she the baby was found in the attic, Johnny said that she had found Harmony dead in her crib and didn't want to tell anyone because she was afraid of what would happen if she did so the night before Ronald was supposed to come home. So she popped out the screen, opened the window, and hid some of Harmony's things to make it look like she had been taken from a crib that night. All right. Now, so May of 2007, we have Madeleine McCann being gone missing from her, the vacation flat in Portugal, leaving her two siblings there through supposedly a window. We have now, three months later, Harmony going missing from her place. She was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, from her crib, spirited out a window with a, with a, with a, um, a screen popped you know, out, and she turns out to be in the, in the attic, and her mother killed her. Now, I'm going to tell you why I brought these two things up. One is because, you know, and I can't find it because it's, it's irritating me because, you know, over the years I've done so much casework. I've studied so many things. Sometimes I forget what I, what I looked at at the time and I can't find it again. But there was something about this particular case where the, the, the mother had been kind of obsessed with the Madeleine McCann case. So you see the, you see the relationship. It's just like, oh, Madeleine McCann's mother did said this and did this. And then my daughter, if she goes, you know, I killed her off. I can then pretend she was also abducted, also abducted and pop, you know, make sure it looks like somebody came through the window. So in other words, a copycat, a copycat crime. Now you say, okay, so this happened in 2007. What in the world does this possibly have to do? It's interesting, you know, it's interesting. Uh, that the 2007, we had two crimes that were very similar and a woman who copycatted Madeleine McCann case. Well, I'm going to tell you what's so interesting. Deborah Bradley was stationed. Her husband was stationed. Her first husband was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. She was there at the time. Now you want, now you start going, hmm. So Deborah Bradley was in the same place that little Harmony went missing from. Sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? So Harmony says she came home and the crib was empty. The other children were there. The window was open. The screen was popped out. She must have been kidnapped. What happened in the Deborah Bradley case? Deborah Bradley says the same exact thing happened. Her daughter was missing from the crib. The window was open. The screen was popped out. She was kidnapped. Doesn't that sound like what happened in Fort Bragg, North Carolina with Harmony? And isn't it awful similar to Madeleine McCann? So you see, now the question comes in, and the reason I bring this up, I want you to look at this and say, could this be a second, another copycat crime? In other words, when we try to fix, when, when we try to do things or cover things up, we don't have a lot of brilliant ideas on our own. We're not, we know we're not great fiction writers, most of us, well, except me. <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> Read only the truth. Great fiction book. Click below. Buy that book. Two ninety nine. Anyway. Was that an awful plug in the middle of a show? Yes. Okay. So, but yes, I'm a fiction writer. I think I could do better than what I'm seeing here. But the question comes down, did Deborah Bradley then copycat the Harmony crime who copycatted the Madeleine McCann crime? I find that rather interesting because it's awful similar, is it not? All right. So I wanted to bring that up first before I go into the entire story of the Deborah Bradley, uh, the L Lisa Irwin a crime here. All right, let me check on your comments here. All right, so um, is this true? I did not know this, Doreen. Actually, I might have known this, Doreen, but 
I, I, I was involved in this crime. Not in, I wasn't involved. I was. I, I learned a lot about this crime years ago. And I'm going to bring up a man by the name of Ron Rugen. Um, uh, he is a private investigator who actually lives near the crime. And we were, were buddies over the years. And at the time Lisa, Lisa went missing, we spoke a lot. I know we discussed this case over and over again. And of course, I have no memory, so I don't remember what Ron and I said. And I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Ron Rugen. Ron, if you're out there, okay, I'm going to send you the copy of the video. And then I would love to have a, um, uh, uh, I don't normally do um, interviews, but I think I want to bring Ron on and do a whole interview with Ron because he spent time investigating this case and he, he spoke to Deborah Bradley. He spoke to so many of the people involved in this case. I think you find it interesting. So I think I will do a thing with him because I think it's kind of cool. But I did not know she liked crime stories, or I did and I forgot. Very interesting. All right. Uh, is, that, is that true? She said a lot of things on video that are gone now. Interesting. All right. Um, Sir, oh, did you really, Doreen? You talked to Ron Rugen in a Facebook group. Yeah, I, yeah. No, I say I've known Ron for years, um, and I say uh, my memory is beginning to escape me. As we we talked about so many things, and you know, we're involved in you know sharing a lot of information. And I know he was so into this case. So I, I really, I'm gonna have to do a. I have to do. Maybe it'll be my first true interview of somebody else who's, you know, working as an investigator or profiler. And people have said, "Why don't you do that, Pat?" And I'm like. I'm generally speaking, not, you know, a host, an interviewer or a host, but what the heck, I'll do that. No, Ron will be a great, great guest. So won't you, Ron? <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't watch this yet, so he has no idea I'm talking about him, but I really like him. So anyway, all right. So yes, there, there do seem to be odd parallels. Now, let me point this out. Just because there are parallels does not mean it is it is a copycat crime. This is where things get really tricky with this whole business. And because we're outside the police investigation, I wish I knew what the police encountered when they did their investigation. And we do not know that. They've been very tight-lipped. Uh, I'm not sure why they've been so tight-lipped. It's very clear to me they believe Deborah Bradley did something to her child. That's very clear to me. Uh, but that doesn't mean they weren't looking elsewhere. It doesn't mean because they say, for example, uh, Jersey, the guy Jersey, they say, oh, you know, we're not looking at him. We've moved on. It doesn't really mean that's true. They can they can tell you all kinds of stories because maybe they want Jersey to think they looked on, moved on. Maybe they want Jersey to think they're looking at Deborah, but they're really looking at Jersey. So we really don't know. And I just want you to keep that in mind because outside of an investigation, oftentimes, you know, we just have no clue what they really know. So that's really important to um, Oh, you're saying sightings were pretty much debunked. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to get to the, um, the this. The, I'm, I'm, I think that might be going too far out. Okay, let me go and now describe other things that happened in this case. All right, so let's go to it. All right, so essentially one of the interesting things which is frustrating to me is that, okay, let's go back to what Deborah was doing that evening, which is behind me. See the house, see the steps? She's outside with a with a friend next door drinking on the steps. Have she she bought a box of wine. And the box of wine has a lot of if you drank the whole box of wine, I think you drink like 16 glasses of wine. Crappy wine, because <laughs> it's in a box <laughs> and, and it's cheap, but you can still get like 16, I think you can get 16 glasses out of it. Now, one of the interesting things about this case is, and um I think this is important, more important to point out because. It gets really tough. So one of the tough that was the word was tough. Um, I, I did watch all of Stephanie Harlow's things on there. And Stephanie Harlow often gives a lot of good um, uh, videos and stuff. So I, I, I do recommend her for that. In this particular case, I thought it was interesting because she did two things, which uh, as a profile, I would think oh, maybe maybe not quite right. First of all, she did a lot of defending of Deborah Bradley's behaviors. Secondly, she made up a really great scenario for why Jersey, this other fellow, this this homeless guy, this um, handyman rolling around the neighborhood, uh, did it. And she gave a whole scenario of why he did it, how he did it. And it's one of those things where I call it, um, uh, you're using a lot of imagination and not necessarily facts. And 
perhaps you go too far. But first, let me get to the Deborah. She she did a, she she defended a lot of Deborah's behaviors, and a lot of people have done this. So it's not Stephanie alone. And some of what she says is is reasonable. What she's trying to say is that. So anyway, the story goes that Deborah Bradley uh, puts the baby to bed about six forty. Uh, I don't know how she gets the baby, the baby to go to sleep at 640, but okay, she, supposedly little baby Lisa, she gets her in a crib at 640. So the concept there is that the baby's already in bed and she doesn't have to worry about her anymore. She's got two older boys, but you know, it's, as she points out in many interviews, it's my adult time and I have the right to do with it what I want. And once I finish all my work for the day, and she points out she does all this for the kids, takes them places, uh, kisses their boo-boos and does all this stuff for the kids. But it's adult time in the evening. And so once the kids are like, they're where they need to be, the boys are like watching a movie and the, my baby's in the bed, I can do what I want. So she says she had some drinks. She had this, she sat on the step with her, with her, with her friend next door, uh, apparently with a very large box of wine and drank a lot of wine. Now, and so what Stephanie says, which is not unreasonable, is like, hey, you know, Let's not be so judgy, you know. Let's, you know, a lot of us, you know, hey, we might have a glass of wine in the evening. We might do that. We might have two or three. The kids already asleep, you know. What the heck? Um, we're, we're letting down our hair. We're relaxing. Um, let's not be so. Oh, you shouldn't have a glass of wine in the evening. You know, what if the baby wakes up? You okay? So don't be so judgy. And yes, she has. She likes cheap wine. <laughs> Maybe that's all she can afford, and she likes a lot of it. Now. Um, so let me state what I believe is the problem here. All right. So she's sitting on the doorstep having wine. Now, I'm, as I say, I'm okay with that in a, in a sense. And uh, have I ever sat on a doorstep while my baby was inside having some alcohol? <laughs> I'm taking the fifth. <laughs> But I'm telling you, if you're a mom and if my baby's finally asleep, you're like, oh, man, you know, let me have this, whatever it is, you know. Yes, I have done something similar, although not to the extent that Deborah Bradley did. And this is why this is very important, because there's a when you're starting to defend somebody, you can defend certain behavior, but then you have to be concerned about other behavior. And is that behavior an ongoing and concerning thing? So let me see if I can find this one here. Hold on. I might have to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, 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 there we go. Deborah Bradley. This this was a this was a, uh, a, um, uh, an interview done by um, uh, Megan Megan Kelly. Is that her name? Blank on it. Anyway, it was a ruthless ruthless interview. Ruthless. I've done her. I've been with Megan sometimes. I guess I was. She was on my side, so I don't remember anything being bad. But. Um, she was interviewing Deborah, and she was she was really going after her. And she admits to drinking the night Lisa vanished. She admitted to drinking, and then, then Megan's like, "Oh, how much did you drink?" And she's like, "Well, you know, a couple, a couple, couple of glasses." And then she goes, "Could have been five? And she's like, hey, yeah, "Maybe." Yeah. You know, then she's like, "Could it have been more? It's like ten? Hey, were, were you like, were you like, did you black out?" <laughs> yeah. You know, so anyway, she's. Deborah Bradley admits things and then laughs it off like, like a person who's guilty would, you know, in other words, I don't mean guilty of killing the child, guilty of drinking a heck of a lot. In other words, she has, and then she says, when, when Megan asked her, how many times did she do this? How often did she do this every night? She goes, I don't know, maybe twice a week. Okay. So twice a week you get blind drunk because basically what she was describing was not mild intoxication. She was talking drink until she basically staggered to your bed and crashed um, twice a week. Her mother was an alcoholic. Alcoholism runs in the family. They drink like fish. I think it was her uncle that said, I wouldn't have be surprised if she drank too much and did something bad to the baby. I don't expect a good ending. So this was a, a fam family problem. And so Megan, um, Deborah is trying to toss off the drinking on the porch as just something normal people do, normal moms do, just have a couple of drinks. She wasn't having a couple of drinks. I don't know how much of that box she drank, but she drank a lot of that box. Or, I'm going to point this out, or she's lying and she didn't drink 
hardly any of the box. We don't know how much Deborah Bradley actually drank the night. Just because she says she drank a lot doesn't mean she did drink a lot. So there's two possibilities. One is she drank so damn much that she blacked out, which is what she claims, and went to sleep. And when she, by the time her husband came home at four in the morning and went, hey, wake up, the baby's missing. She went, what? And she had missed out. She had been dead, dead out of it, you know, with liquor for a long time. Or maybe she hadn't drank that much. Maybe she was totally in control of what she was doing that night. And we just don't know that because we're believing what she said. I don't believe she got an alcohol test that night. So we don't know. We really do not know how much she drank. Um, but what is concerning is two things. One is if she's making up how much she drank, then she is um, lying and possibly a manipulator and a psychopath. If she did drink that absolute much and she does that constantly, uh, she's not taking care of her children. I don't care what you do during the day, but if you drink, so you put your baby down at 640 at night and you drink yourself into oblivion so that you wouldn't have woken up at all for 12 hours because you're so out of it that you don't know what's happening with your sons or your, or your child. You know, I get it that once, you know, one, let's say the whole year goes by and it's your birthday and you go out and you, 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 you don't realize how much alcohol was in that drink. You know, one of those drinks that has five different kinds of alcohol in it and you drink that and you go, Oh shit, I don't want to get home. <laughs> okay. And you're throwing up and, you know, out of the car because you didn't realize how much you drank and then you get home and then the worm's spinning. You do that once a year. Okay. You, you made a mistake. You get drunk twice a week or more because of, remember the two drink thing? No officer. I just had two drinks. Oh, I only drank twice a week. No, you probably drank every night and you're drinking to massive excess, which means you are not able to care for your children. Once you reach that state and you have two other children in the house and you've got a baby in the house and you're, you're drunk off your butt and you are out of it. You either blacked out, you're passed out. You can't take care of your children. I'm sorry. That's not good mothering. And so I'm sorry, Stephanie. I know you want to try to like, you know, say, Hey, we're, you know, we all been there. No, she been there a lot. <laughs> we only been there maybe a couple of times. She been there a lot. <laughs> There's a difference. And a pattern is what I'm talking about. Patterns are important. <sighs> because patterns show us what could be true. Now, one of the other things that's very interesting is that one of the reasons people really truly believe De Deborah Bradley, she's really, she cries really, really well. I mean, she does, she cries really, really well. Um, she cries, her husband just kind of stares into space like he's a zombie, but she cries like a son of a gun. Um, and normally when people cry you know, a lot, she comes off as very, you know, she's a very upset and you want to believe that. And oh my God, she's, I, I know many people say, okay, I've seen other people and I don't believe them, but I believe Deborah Bradley. All right. Let's go to, is it possible that she's a good actress? Now, apparently back old, back there in North Carolina, um, after this all happened, um, back in uh, Fort Bragg, she was married to another man and she had a couple of friends and they all turned on her and they said, we were good friends with her and we don't want to have anything to do with her now. They said, she's a liar. She's a manipulator. She tries to mess with other women's husbands. You can't trust her as far as you can throw her. You know, and they really came out against her. Now, they could be just, you know, jealous ladies, you know, because I'm sure there's a few people who want to take me down. <laughs> but here's what I find interesting. Her ex-mother-in-law threw her out of the house twice. Why? Because she lied, took advantage of, of the mother-in-law in the situation. I think she was I took a vehicle she wasn't supposed to touch. Mother-in-law threw her out. Mother-in-law didn't trust her. So now you've got two women who said they knew her in Fort Bragg. They didn't, they, they, they ended their friendship over the fact they thought she was a manipulator and they couldn't trust her. And they said she's a brilliant actress. She'll fool you. The ex-mother-in-law threw her out of the house twice. So now I say to myself, that's history. Now I don't know how accurate the history is, but that's history. And can I, can we trust what she says now about, and of course she lied about how much she drank. She started out with two, two, two drinks. And now she's up to have, oh God, I don't know how much of the box she's claiming she drank. 
Then something else changed. And this is what else changed. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay. She admits to drinking. Yeah. Okay. The last time the parents changed the time they last saw the baby. Okay. So she said originally she put the baby down at 640 and then she's drinking with a friend on the porch about 10 something. She gets up. She goes back in. She checks on the baby. And then she lies down in her, in the bed with one of their sons and the other son goes to the other room. Let me just show you the house layout just so you can see it. Parents room on the left. So there she is. Supposedly she's now sleeping with her son there. She's checked on Lisa in Lisa's room. The Lisa, the baby's still sleeping in the, in the bed there in the crib. Sorry. And then the other boys in the boys room, the computer room is where the husband comes home and he says he saw that the window open and the, the screen pushed in slightly. Um, and I'll get to why that is probably bogus, um, but that's what he says. And all the lights blazing on in the house. All right. So she says she checked on Lisa in her bed in her crib after a friend went home. Then later on, on the uh, after Megan starts grilling her, she goes, "Well, maybe I didn't. Maybe by that time I was like too drunk. I just went to sleep." So now she's saying she never saw the child since six six forty at night. She never actually checked on the child again. So essentially when Jeremy came home, and supposedly so now we're talking about four o'clock in the morning and that's a whole nother kettle of worms. Um, the child had been lying there for 10 hours. I mean, she's 11, was she 11 months old? How old was that child? Hold on a second. Let me check that out. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I got, I got noise in the background. That's, that's Stephanie talking. Okay. Yeah, Stephanie, love that you. But, been on them they what? Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. <laughs> Click the wrong button. Okay, I just want—I just want to check how old Lisa was when she when she went missing. She was. She was. Where is it? Well, come on now. Okay, hold on a second. Ah, alrighty then. Okay. Well, that's useless some reason the uh the, the the wikipedia has failed to tell me how old lisa was when she when she when she went missing let me try again lisa Irwin. um somebody give me the 10 months old okay she's 10 months the only reason i wonder about that is because you know it depends again if i were a police detective i'd be asking everybody who knew her including her father and the brothers and everybody how often did she sleep through the night like when you put her down 6 40 which is quite early and then did she just sleep through 12 hours and not need a bottle not wake up i i'm i'm guessing at this point that deborah bradley was not nursing her but my 10 month old baby was like glued to me and um <laughs> every two hours every hour you know it's like there was no sleeping through the night uh, but that's my experience now, Deborah Bradley might have been bottle feeding and had a, a, a pattern and the child might have accepted that the bottle gets fed to her. I didn't hear that Deborah Bradley gave her the bottle before they started drinking. I didn't hear about that. Like, that's what I would want to know as a, as a detective or as a profiler. I would want to interview Deborah Bradley and say, when was the last bottle given to her? And when were you planning to give her the next bottle? Because that's important. Because if you're going to give her a bottle at, uh, say, six o'clock, were you, what, did she just sleep through the six in the morning? Is that the way it worked? Or did you normally give her a bottle at midnight? I mean, I don't know. I would like to know because that proves a lot to me as to how much she was being cared for and, and, and what, your whole, what your whole mothering method was. So I'd like to know that. So, but that was very interesting. So she, they changed the story about uh, when she last saw the baby. So Last, she actually said she saw the baby was, uh, let's see, it was 6.40 at night. Six th uh, no, she said approximately 6 o'clock. Mm. She also says, um, this is the FBI site. Let me just pull this up. FBI site said she uh, last seen in her crib approximately 6 p.m. wearing purple pants and a purple shirt with kittens on it. This is also important. The purple shirt and the purple kit. Oh, the purple, she's got a purple outfit on when she's put to bed. Again, as a police officer, I'd like to know, uh, you know, did you did you change her before she went to bed? Did you feed her? What did you do before you had the box of wine? Now, I want to know that so I can see the pattern. Um, but apparently she's put to bed at 640, 6 o'clock. 
six o'clock. That's what the FBI say, says. And she's never, never checked again. And the father comes in at four in the morning, which is 10 hours later and finds her missing from the crib. This is now there's two things I want to point out here because I also don't know the answers to this. The father usually never worked at nights and supposedly suddenly had to go do this job at night. And I want to know, is there proof of the job he was doing at night? Was there proof when he left the house? Was there proof when he returned to the house? Was there proof he never left the job in the middle of the job? So I don't, I don't know about any CCTV, any, any video surveillance that ever caught the father coming and going from the house or from his job. I don't, I can't find one word on that. And I think that's interesting because is there proof he was at the job the entire time? And is there proof even when, you know, that he returned home at 4 a.m.? What if he returned home at 1 a.m. and found a dead baby and then spent three hours driving around and putting her body someplace? I don't know, but I can't find any information on it. So that's something I'd like to know. Um, the other thing I'd like to know, um, okay, so we have we, we have this issue with Jeremy, Jeremy Irwin not knowing exactly where he is and, and just no video on it. Um, just, just missing information, very much missing information. So that is something I'd like to know. Um, then let's see, what was the next thing he said? Oh, then Jeremy Irwin says something else. I think it's just kind of makes me go, hmm. So he talks about this, this, this open window in the office and, uh, that somebody crawled in through that. But yet the police have discounted that. They said there's no way somebody could have gotten through that window because there's no footprints outside, very similar to the McCann case. No proof anybody came through the window. So there's no proof anybody came through that. Then he says, well, the front door was unlocked. Okay, did Deborah leave that unlocked? Well, she was drunk. She might well have left that unlocked. That's true. Um, then there's the issue of the lights blazing all over the house. So... The neighbor claims that she saw the lights go off in the house. Again, I don't know the validity of this. The lights go off in the house. Well, do you honestly think somebody's going to come in to steal a baby and turn all the lights on through the entire house? <laughs> Let me look for a baby. You know, they'd have to first of all know that the baby was even there. Why would they even go look for a baby? But, you know, but they have to, are they turning all the lights on? Or was a drunk, did a drunk Deborah Bradley never turn the lights off? That makes more sense to me because if I were like really trashed, I don't think I'd be wasting my time turning off lights. I'd be going, where's the bed? You know, where's the bed? Let me go. You know, so I don't know. Can we believe the neighbor? And that, again, is a question. So when we get information from outside the police reports, do we know that the neighbor knew what they were talking about? Were the lights on or off? But, but, but Jeremy Irwin says they were on when he came home. And I can't for a minute fathom why somebody coming in to steal a baby would turn all the lights on in the home. Because, first of all, Jeremy, this was not normal for him to leave at night. So anybody who saw him leave would probably think he's just going down to the store to buy some liquor. You know what I mean? He's not going to think he's necessarily going off for the whole night. So how would he know that if he broke? So he sees, De this is the story. So Deborah's on the step. She's like, she's like, okay, I'm going to use this as my example here. So she's on the step of the girlfriend. She having a good time. She's getting trash drunk. She's had a lot. So somebody's like peeping through the bushes. This is supposed to be this Jersey guy. Oh, I'll get to Jersey in a minute. Jersey peeping through the bushes. He sees her. She's on the step. She's laughing loud, smoking her cigarettes, having a good time, yelling at the kids, go to sleep. <laughs> and then she's like, oh, I got to go to bed. Her friend goes off. She goes in the house. Jersey's in the bushes. I'm going to go into Jersey. Jersey's in the bushes going, oh, see, she's drunk over ass. She's going in there now. Hey, her husband's not home. He has no idea. His husband has always been home. If he's been watching the house, he knows the husband's home all the time. So if he's gone, he has no idea he's gone to do a job to four in the morning. He's going to think he's out doing something short, short time. Because, you know, when you're being, um, oh, I'll give you an example. Because this actually did happen to me. So I'm, I had a baby my daughter i was in california and we were poor at the time and i lived in a not so great neighborhood in an, in an apartment so i'm in my apartment it's during the day i'm sitting there with my baby and we always left the doors open and all you know we just did and we just came in and out of each other's houses and so this dude comes into my house hey he sees me with the baby i'm nursing it he's like hey your husband home and i'm like my husband was at work 
my husband gone. He was in a training program. He was gone, going to be gone for the next seven hours. Do you know what I said? I said, no, man, he's not home. I, he went, he went down to the store in the corner. He's going to pick up some, he's going to pick up some stuff. Come on back. He'll be back in like 10 minutes. You want to sit down? The guy said, no, it's all right. He left. He was casing my place to steal stuff. <laughs> but I told him my husband was at the liquor store because anybody who knows that neighborhood knows people do to go to the liquor store for just 10 minutes, pick up their stuff, come home. So this guy, Jersey's in the bushes. He's looking. Oh, now she's gone inside. Her husband's been gone a long time, but he doesn't know when the husband's coming back. He doesn't know the husband's working. The husband could be back any minute. So are you really going to, I don't know how he's getting the house. She left the door open. So he walked in right behind her. Threw all the lights on, went looking for a baby. Really? It's a little bit of an odd story. So, but that is a story that they're claiming. Now, let me let you know one more thing before I, I'm going to check some of your comments now. But I want to point out one more thing before we go on. They also claim, because um, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of other information from Ron Rugen and also from other sources. Um, let me see if this is it. Yes. Uh, Lisa Irwin's parents claimed the intruder took cell phones. And this is very important. So apparently they had three cell phones in the house. Jeremy had his business, his, his phone from work. He had a work phone, which was with him. But at home they had his phone, her phone, and, and her dad, I think it was her dad's phone or her uncle's phone. Somebody gave her a phone because her phone, they haven't paid the bills on their phones. So her phone, their phones weren't working. So they, she was given a phone to borrow, but that phone wasn't working either. So I don't know, three dead phones. <laughs> I'm wondering how much of this were burner phones, but hey, you know, that's a whole nother thing. Burner phones. Anyway, three phones are supposedly on the counter charging because they were also. Okay, okay wait a minute. Let me, th let me think about this. So you haven't paid the bills on any of the three phones, but you're going to charge all three phones because you need them to work even though they won't work because you haven't paid the bills so they're not going to work anyway. Why are you charging the phones? What's the purpose of charging phones that you can't use? I don't think anybody's ever talked about that. That's interesting. Hmm. So that's another whole interesting issue. So they, they claim these three, three phones were stolen uh, by somebody who just... For some reason, which is, this is an interesting story again, why would somebody come into a house to steal three crappy phones and and a baby? Is it wasn't there a movie, Three Phones and a Baby? <laughs> no, it's Three Men and a Baby, but Three Phones and a Baby. This should make a good phone. Okay, I'm going to go up and check the comments because it has been so much information since I've started talking. Oh, my goodness. Um. Let me go back, and then I'm going to go into what other information we have on the sightings of Jersey. I'm going to go into a whole thing about Jersey. Yes, she does still live there. Um, this is another interesting point. Uh, it may be just because they can't afford to move. Uh, because some people say, why would you live in a house where your baby's missing? Where where you could, every day you look in there and think, oh, my baby, that's where my baby is. Or wasn't, or isn't anymore. Um, but, um, but... It was a baby. So the baby's not the baby's not going to want to come home. You know what I'm saying? You know, see what I'm saying here? The baby is not necessarily, you know, it's not like if a six-year-old's missing, you want to make sure his room stays the same so he can come home to it. This is a baby. The baby doesn't know crib, where the crib is. So it really doesn't matter where the heck you live anyway. So that's totally unimportant that you stay in that home. Why they're in the home, I'm not quite sure. Oh, I just noticed something terrible here. Oh, what in the world is going on? Hmm. Is everybody seeing this clearly? Because for some reason, um, my, I'm not plugged into the internet. It just went out on me. Is everybody seeing everything clearly? Oh, this is very frustrating. I hate it when this happens because it drives me nuts. Um, because sometimes when you, when you do, um, when you don't, aren't plugged into the internet, you don't have a good broadcast and I hate to see this whole broadcast go to hell. Um, but are you seeing clearly so far? Um, because it's my, my, I don't know why that's not working. Hold on. I'm going to try to see if I can pull it, pull it back up, but it's gone missing. That's very annoying, but hopefully this will come out. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't, I didn't check that before I started. Anyway, let me, let me see what else you need here. Um, uh, crocodile tears. It's possible, you know, possible. 
you know, some people are able to turn on the tears and, and that's, that's a question. And so just because somebody does cry doesn't mean that they actually have that emotion. But then again, sometimes people don't cry and people say, why aren't they crying? So it always becomes that question of, you know, are they, what, what do tears mean? And I have seen times when you can tell people can lose it completely. And the, the, it's more just, not just tears. It's the voices. Uh, things catch. You can tell when they're losing it. And I did not see that with Deborah Bradley. I didn't see that kind of catch in the voice. I more saw the tears than I saw the, the other emotions that were expressed through, through the body. I did not see that. Now, this is interesting. You say she's crying for herself. Actually, Ron Rugen says when he was with her, she didn't seem to cry for uh, uh, Lisa as much as she cried about the people who are who are saying bad things about her on the internet. So that's what Ron Rugen had to say, which I thought was interesting. Um, oh my! Okay, now I, now my 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 internet is theoretically back. Let's hope it's still here. It's so annoying. I've had that happen before, where I think everything is beautiful because it's all being on the internet, and it's like. <laughs> I'm like, that whole show just went to hell. Uh, what did Molly say? Because because she just said here, <laughs> oh, he's adult, I think. Now, Doreen, I don't know if Doreen is pulling out my usual statements about being adult, um, but I've often said that women who exhibit Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where they kill the children or do things to the children to get attention, their husbands are usually adult, meaning, meaning that as long as he gets his needs met, which is sex and food, um, as long, whatever his wife does kind of doesn't bother him. He just like goes along with the whole program and I call him adult. So he's not a bad guy. He's just a guy that doesn't pay any attention to anything as long as he's getting his needs met. But I, I, I don't know if that's what you're referring to Doreen, but I do say he's adult quite often. And that may be, uh, you know, some people think he's involved in maybe moving the baby's body, but is he, I don't know because we have, a whole lack of information. We do. We have a tremendous lack of information. And one of the things you have to do when you're an investigator and what the police may be doing that everybody's jumping on them for is they may believe things or believe things are possible, but they can't prove it and they can't quite get enough information to go forward. So you can think what you want to think, but can you go forward with it is a point. Um, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, Okay. Annika says, I believed her crying. If she has substances in her, it's easy to get worked up. Uh, um, I'm trying to think about that. She's on anti-anxiety medicine and she was, um, and then she has, does out do alcohol. I don't know what else she might've done. You know, once the baby has gone missing, it is possible. Sometimes, you know, doctors do prescribe things, you know, because you're, you know, you're having issues, <laughs> you know, I mean, the baby's been theoretically kidnapped and I mean, I, I don't know if my baby had been kidnapped. I think I will take whatever the doctor gives me. And, and I don't use any, any medication at all. Um, but yes. And that's also possibly true that people can use certain things to help them perform, shall we say. Uh, and I've shown you in a couple of different other uh, videos where I fake stuff and y'all bought it. <laughs> the last one was how my father abused me and sold me off into sex slavery. <laughs> and somebody like, Oh no, Pat, that's horrible. I'm like, Oh, my daddy's wonderful. I made that up, you know, because I want to show you how quickly it can be done if you're good. Um, and I'm not, you know, and there's people who are way better than me at being able to manipulate um, because I'm just doing it for a show here, but there are people who are psychopathic who, who you know, who, just really good narcissism can really turn it on in like seconds to make you believe something is true. That isn't true at all. I don't know that this is Deborah Bradley, but some of her friends and, and ex friends, shall we say, believe she can do that. So this is what we don't know about her at all. Um, <laughs> Annika says my son never slept more than two hours in a row ever. <laughs> you know, this is, and this is an interesting point about mothering and babies because, um, there are different methods of, of raising children. And there are those who believe, you know, you put your baby down and it has to get used to just you know, sleep through the night kid. Um, and then there are other mothers. I was kind of one of those uh, who I slept with all my babies. I had a family bed. Um, and so that baby just basically nursed whenever the baby wanted to nurse, which meant I didn't sleep for four years, two children, four years um, that I was nursing. Um, I, I'm not saying one is right or wrong. It's just different differences in, in, in mothering methodologies, but, we have to, we'd have to know what her mothering methodology is. 
um, to know whether she went off track on that uh, or not. So that, that's always important to know. Um, let me go back through a few more here. Oh, let's see this. Oh, I want to hear this. because Lots of kids sleep six, six after the give of the nap, but after age two or three. Interesting. All right. I don't know much of that. My kids never slept, <laughs> never slept at all, but my granddaughter slept so much, I actually had to wake her up to feed her. <laughs> you know, babies are very different. And again, as a police officer, a detective, I'd want to know. Okay, Bra Deborah. Tell me the history of your baby. And I want to hear that from Jeremy too. And anybody who knows her, what is the history of this baby? Um, my daughter was, I called her a shark. Um, she's like never slept and she nursed constantly. My son, David was a lot better. Um, he had a lot more time in between. So I was like, Oh, what a, what a breeze this kid is. And then I adopted my son, Jeremy. And since I adopted him at age five, he was great. <laughs> as far as I know, he slept through the night and never nursed me. So, you know, uh, but it's different for every baby. So we have to know that we'd have to be able to investigate that. Um, uh, this is a good question. Were the other kiddos awake when the baby was put down? Yes. They were watching like some movie and then they eventually went in with her. What's interesting is that supposedly the kids heard something and the police questioned them about that. But then Deborah said she'd never questioned them about that. And that was kind of like weird. It's like, wouldn't you be all over your kids? Hey, what did you hear? You know, what did you know? What do you, you know, who came in the house? Did you see something? I thought it was kind of strange that she didn't seem to be overly inspired to, to learn that. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, if she killed, if she got so drunk and killed the baby, where's the body? This is a good question, Carolina. Um, one theory. Okay, so I'm going to do the two theories. I'll do Jersey next. Okay, so let me do the, dude, because you're bringing that up. Let's get back into it. The theory for, well, one of the theories is that she got really drunk, put the baby in bed with her, and rolled over on the baby. And and because she was so drunk, she didn't know she'd rolled over on the baby, and the baby's underneath going, and suffocated. Now, that happens. Now, I am a, 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 I am a very strong supporter of family beds and sleeping with babies. So I'll put that out there right now. You can disagree with me, but I am a strong supporter. So at least you know where I'm coming from. I'm a strong supporter of that. I slept with my babies, and I nursed them all night, and they never had a crib. I never owned a crib. Uh, and But I never was also drunk in the bed with my babies. So so I had, you know, when I put the baby next to me, I had my arm like, you know, this, so the baby wouldn't fall off the bed. And I was very careful about the baby and knew what the baby was doing and knew where I was and knew where the baby was. However, I have heard that the times that babies end up getting smothered in bed, where, which is when people say, oh, you should never sleep with a baby, almost always has to do with a woman who is heavily, basically, she's very drunk. And she's unaware of what she's doing. And she rolls over and on the baby. And oftentimes she's also overweight, which is just an aside. But, you know, the simple fact that the more weight you have, the more weight you, you know, you, you, you smother the kid with. Um, that tends to be the case. So Deborah Bradley was overweight and she was supposedly drunk. So the theory could be that she put the, you know, she had the baby, she put the baby down the bed, she rolled over on it and it smothered. Now, they brought in a cadaver dog, and the cadaver dog hit next to her bed. And also, apparently, someplace else, the cadaver dog hit there. That's one of the reasons the police did focus in on them. Very similar to the Madeleine McCann case, where the cadaver dogs hit on behind the sofa with the Madeleine McCann, um, and which is why a lot of people believe she died in the apartment in Portugal. Here we have a case where the, the dogs hit next to the bed. Now, um, Stephanie... Uh, and her thing says, well, that's impossible because the baby hadn't been dead long enough. Um, you need 24, 48 hours. That's just not true. Um, you, the, the, the baby starts decomposing. Like once a child, once a body dies, it decomposes immediately. Now you may not see the de decomposition immediately, but it starts quite quickly. So the, there's always a question of how long do you need? And actually you need way less time than Stephanie believes you need. Because in the Kamala McCann case, it was like with an hour, you know, that the dogs could hit. And so we're having here a case of uh, a very short period of time. The baby, she may have lied on the baby and whatever, and 
whatever, put the baby invention on the floor and didn't know what to do and left it there for a couple hours trying to figure out what to do. The dogs hit on that spot. Are the dogs correct? I do not know. I do have a great uh, respect for cadaver dogs, but I can't say they can't testify in a court of law. And there's a lot of arguments over that, but the cadaver dogs did hit. And that's one reason there's a theory that Deborah Bradley killed her kid and then covered it up. Now, your other question is very good. Let me put it back on. Oh, I'm sorry. Not that my girl slept. Um, where'd it go? Uh, oh, okay. Here's where, where is the body? Yeah, Carolina, there is the problem. So some people would say, well, she was that damn drunk. How would she actually cover this crime up? Because she wasn't in her right mind. Would she be able to, like, drunk in state, pick up the baby, put it in a vehicle, drive it someplace, and bury it somewhere? Or throw it in a river? I can't say she could or she couldn't. We don't have, apparently, any CCTV, and I don't understand this. It's driving me crazy. Or did Jeremy come home and find the baby dead and then do something to save his wife and the family? We don't know. That's another theory. So obviously the body's never been found. Uh, do I believe the baby's alive? That's another theory, uh, which I find hard to believe. Uh, she's never been found. I'm going to go into that in just a minute. Uh, but no, um, we don't. The baby has never been found alive or or dead. Um, so, and that's a good question. And that's one of the reasons this case is very difficult. Um, <laughs> Doreen says, yes, that's what I meant. Pat Jeremy seems like a dope. <laughs> ah, glad you've learned my word. Ah, that's great. Um, did the older kids have any contributions to law enforcement? I do not know. We don't have the behind the scenes stuff at all. Oh, your baby slept with you too. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm kind of big into that. But anyway, that's not, nothing, neither here or there with this case. Okay. All right. So who makes an accident look like murder? Okay, Carrie, many people do. What ha now, what happens is the, the whole theory behind that is that Mac Madeline McCann theory and the, and the case in, in uh, Fort Bragg that I talked about is either you have poorly cared for your child and it dies and you cover that up because that's that would be abuse. Or you in the Madeline McCann case, it, the theory is that the kids might have been given medication to make them sleep and Madeline McCann got a little too much or got too much in her system and fell behind the couch and died of a positional asphyxiation. But then when the parents found that, they're like, oh, my God, if we if the police come in here, we're going to lose custody of our other children. We're going to go to jail. We're going to lose our licenses. All kinds of bad things happen. If if Deborah Bradley, who they know the family is a little bit on the edge anyway, as it was, if Deborah Bradley accidentally killed her kid, it's not, you know, an accident is questionable. She's drunk when she does it. That becomes Actually, abuse. I mean, you killed your kid because it was manslaughter. It's manslaughter. It's not, it's not murder, but it's manslaughter because you killed your child due to your, your behavior. And so that becomes manslaughter, which means, A, you can go to prison, and two, what happens to the other children in the house? Do social services come in and take the kids? So, oh, people do this all the time, covering up for accidents, you know, usually because it's not just an accident. It's usually something in the parental behavior that leads to the accident you know so um uh like i said if she was a proper drunk after a little sleep she's been she'd be sobered up enough if she's an alcoholic that's a good point anarchy because now when jeremy supposedly came home at four o'clock in the morning and went found the baby missing went hey wake up she supposedly jumped right up ran around saying hey well lisa lisa where are you where are you and then she fell to the floor sobbing she wasn't that drunk she couldn't get out of bed because if you're super super drunk and out of it, you know, I don't care who, who punches you in the shoulder. You know? You're like, I can't get up. You can't, you can't even think. So she might have either not drank as much as she says she did, or she is a proper alcoholic. That is possible. Oh, well, it Lila, Lila has to go watch the rerun. Well, I'll be here, Lila. You know, it'll be here hopefully forever. <laughs> Bye. Okay, let me get to let me get to Jeremy. Now. Now we have the three cell phone issue and the, and the sightings of this, this person. All right. So what happened was after the three phones were stolen, supposedly, 
what happens is there was a phone call. And let me see. I'm going to see if I can pull up this up by Ron Rugen because Ron has a really good thing on this. Oh, and I, I have so many pages for, from Ron. I may not get to them all for sure. But let me see. Um, I'm trying to find the cell phone stuff because he's more accurate than anybody else. Um, hold on a second. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start here. All right, let's, okay, so let's let's look at this this couple. All right, let's look at them. So what happens is supposedly three cell phones go missing. Uh, oh, well, let's go to the person they think they see. Okay, there's a person people think they see. Okay, there's three sightings of a person. All right, of a man carrying a baby. Now, let's go here. Okay, so first we see baby Lisa's home. That's where she lives on the left at 12:15 p.m. There's a first sighting. This is a neighbor. A neighbor says she sees a man walking up by with a baby in his arms, with just a diaper on. But he, but he seems like he's he's held the baby before. It doesn't seem like he's awkward or anything. And she thought it was weird. But then he went into some house, or into some house location, and so she went. Interesting. So that was the first sighting. Um, then there was a second sighting. Okay, wait a minute. Where's the second? Oh, second sighting is the surveillance footage. Now, the surveillance footage, in my opinion, yeah, and pretty much the police opinion, this is this is just this is plain junk. Um, let me let me go find the. All right, that would be. If you look, if you look over here, see that over here. <laughs> That's what they saw. So it looks like a ghost. But anyway, some guy supposedly dressed in white coming out of the woods. And they pretty much discounted that. So that really wasn't very impressive. So they kind of got rid of that. But anyway, oh, wait a minute. Where did it, where did it go? Hold on a second. Where did it go? Okay, here. Okay, that's the first sighting. Okay, we got the first sighting. And then we have the second sighting is over. Okay, at 2.15 p.m. I'm sorry, 2.15 a.m. The surveillance footage is over there. Now, 4.10 a.m., Go way over there. 4, 10 a.m., there is another sighting, okay? Now, that sighting. Now, now remember, the first sighting is at 12. The other sighting is at 4. I have an issue when there's four hours between. Like, what the hell are you doing with the baby for four hours? I mean, you know, is it the, are we really seeing this guy running around the neighborhood for four hours with a baby? I mean, is that? And then nobody's saying the baby looks dead. So they're saying four hours. Now, Ron Rugen talks to the guy who, the four o'clock sighting, he's a guy on a motorcycle. And it's an interesting story. Um, let me tell it to you. All right. So let's see if I can find it. Okay. Hold on a second. I've got so much information on this. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, okay, where is it? All right. There we go. I got to turn my thing upside down here. All right. Pull that out of here. No, don't do that. Hold on a second. All right. So he goes and talks to this dude. Um, guy's name is Mike Thompson. He's on the motorcycle at 4, 4.15, I please. So anyway, he says, I reached out to Mike Thompson for just that reason. He wanted to find out about, about, about these sightings of maybe baby Lisa being carried away by a dude and not by Deborah Bradley or by her husband. Um, although he was, yeah, so somewhere around there. Okay, so if you remember, Mike is is the one I think might, okay, wait a minute. If you remember, Mike is one of what I think might be two credible sightings in the overnight hours that Lisa went missing. The first interesting sighting for me is the 1215 report by the neighbors. That's the one near their house that saw the guy walking by with the baby. Uh, the surveillance video at the BP gas station has become what many of us feel is nothing. So let's get rid of that one. So we got 1215, the neighbors see somebody walking along with a baby. Then at 415, this is the other sighting. So now let's, he calls Thompson. He was very cooperative. I wanted to meet him at the intersection to see where he was at that time at 4 a.m. in the morning on October 4th, 2011. We met. All right. He told me this story. Um, by the way, it was a much colder day. Then the lower 50s, the night went missing. So it was in the 50s that Lisa went missing. So 50s is not freezing cold. It's just not warm. Um, all right. Mike was getting off work, driving south on his motorcycle. 
He saw a man walking from the south side of 48th, crossing the road and heading north on North Randolph. Mike stopped his motorcycle at the intersection. It was very well lit with streetlights. By this time, a man carrying a baby was probably around 20 or 30 yards north of the intersection walking on North Randolph. Mike said he hollered, are you okay? The man turned toward Thompson, a baby clearly visible in his arms, only in a diaper, sitting straight up in his arms and alert. So in other words, this was a live baby, not a dead baby. Okay. Um, the man responded only with a knob and said, are you okay? He goes, Mike says the man had salt and pepper hair, short hair, but long enough for a comb. It was not a buzz cut. And this is important. It was not a buzz cut. So he had salt and pepper hair, you know, coming out here. You could comb through it, right? Um, uh, let's see. He is confident the man not only had a baby in his arms, but was a live baby. The baby was clearly visible. was not mistaken for a bag. <laughs> All right. So anyway, he said that um, he recalls telling the man he ought better get a coat or a blanket or something that that effect on the baby. He found it odd. Mike then drove off. And that was that. So he never thought much about it until he found out about Lisa. Then he did, did speak on that. Well, the theory is the baby goes missing. Let's look at the, let's look at the picture again. Okay. So the baby goes missing out of the house at some point. Wait a minute. Um, I'm sorry. That's the wrong one. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Where's my picture? Yeah, the sightings. I want the sighting pictures. Hold on. Now I'm having problems here. Hold on. Oh dear. What, what's happening? Sorry, I'm having I'm having technical issues. Okay. All right, here we are. All right, so we have the, the, the home there. The first sighting is over, a few streets over at 1215. Then we have the second. Then we, let's ignore the surveillance footage. So 1215 is the first, and then 410 is another sighting. That's three miles away. Somebody walked three miles with a baby from, the, the, this is theory. Would they have done that? Would they have walked three miles away? And that is a long way to go. Now, so we can confuse things even more. Let's look at, by the way, this is Ron Rugan. Hi, Ron. That is Ron Rugan, the private investigator. Hi, Ron. All right. So I'm going to get him on here. I swear to God, I am. All right. So let me go back to, let me talk about the phone call because we're going to stick that in here now. All right. So now this, the phone call is a weird issue. So the three phones were taken. Phones are missing, right? All right. Let me find the issue on the phone call. So because Ron Rugen also is, is very good about the phone calls. So I want to make, use his, his statements on that because the rest of people's statements are kind of crappy. All right, where's the phone calls? Hold on. All right, speaking of the phone records. All right, there was a phone call. Now, so these three phones were taken, but they were all non-functional. It supposedly doesn't mean you can't try to make a phone call. It just doesn't go through. At 11.57 p.m., there was a phone call, an attempted phone call made from Deborah Bradley's phone. All right. Supposedly, it was her phone, this woman by the name of Megan Wright. Now, you wonder who the hell is Megan Wright? And what is it? Her? Why would anybody call her phone? Well, this guy, his name is John Tanko. Now, he was called Jersey. This dude was in the neighborhood near Deborah Bradley's house. He was in the neighbor. He worked for the neighbors. He was a handyman who had a shall we say, a criminal record. And remember, I've talked to you about handymen before. I'm like, the number one, one of the number one jobs of serial killers is handymen. And why is that? Because it's an easy job to get. You, nobody has to hire you. You can go knock on people's doors. You can give them a slip of paper and say, I can fix stuff. I've had handymen work for me. One of my handymen that worked for me had just gotten out of a penitentiary for murder one. So the, and he was a psychopath. I'm like, I think he was a serial killer. So anyway, that's a long story. Uh, but he, um, so you get some handymen who are really shady. Okay. And, uh, again, not all handymen are shady. Some handymen are lovely and I have one in my family. So, Hey, I'm, I'm not against handymen. I'm just pointing out that it is an easier job to get and do because you can do that on your own and do, you know, little side jobs. So this guy was rolling around the neighborhood. Everybody said he was super friendly, really nice. Um, but and he was doing these jobs for people and, but he had a record and he had a warrant out for him <laughs> and he had done burglaries. So, hey, you know, the guy's not exactly, and he's got drug issues. So anyway, so he 
this was his girlfriend, okay? So he's in the neighborhood right next door, take doing uh, work. Uh, he was supposed to, t the next door neighbor had um, like um, uh, um, sprinklers that were on. He was supposed to turn them on and off. And so he would like, right, be right near the Bradley house. He would be. So anyway, which is why he's a great suspect. Now he was hooked up with this girl. They had an on and off again relationship. She claims that he was kind of like, you know, she, she dumped him because she was having issues with him. But here's the thing. Deborah Bradley's phone, somebody made an attempt after that, after the phones were stolen, somebody made an attempt to make a phone call. That phone call went to her phone. That's his girlfriend. And he's in the neighborhood as a local handyman. Now, some people claim that she wanted to have a baby. And so he stole a baby for her. Okay. <laughs> now people do steal babies. They do this, but usually it's women who steal babies, not the men. Women usually steal the babies. They usually, they usually are women who look like they were, they were either look pregnant. They maybe they're overweight and they pretend they're pregnant. And then they steal somebody's baby. And sometimes out of some woman's stomach, like, you know, take the baby and run. Um, and then say, look, I just had a baby. Um, and people believe them because they don't know. They, you know, they were gone for some time or they looked over, they looked overweight. So they thought they were pregnant and they pretend it's their baby. Usually it's because it's an infant. You don't bring like an 11 month old baby home and say, well, this one's 10 months, 10 month baby. Hey, look, it's just a baby. You know, and it, I mean, okay. The dude might be a psychopath. I don't know. The dude might be a lifelong criminal, might be a drug dealer. He might be, you know, just an all, all around crook. I don't know what kind of guy he is, but is he that dumb that he would go and steal a baby for his girlfriend that's 11 months old? I mean, I mean, 10 months and say, here, I brought you a baby. I mean, is that really what he'd do? So that whole theory to me just is, it just makes no sense at all. And they they were broken up. He she had dumped him. So I mean, is he trying to get her back by bringing her a baby? <laughs> I mean, that's a little far fetched in my opinion. I'm not buying it. Um, but and some people will say, well, what he was actually doing is stealing the baby to sell the baby. But you know, selling babies is not easy. So especially eleven month old. I keep saying 11 because the other one was 11 months. 10 month old baby, baby Lisa is a big baby. She, she's not an infant. It's hard to sell a bigger baby. And does he know lots of people buy babies? I mean, really? And the guy who's walking around the neighborhood with the baby doesn't seem to be all uh, perturbed about carrying the baby around. So it's like, wouldn't he be paranoid? Wouldn't he put the something over the baby to cover it? There was, people wouldn't see it was a baby. Wouldn't he put it in a bag? Why not put it in a sports bag? Like maybe some people we know. <clears throat> I'm referring to a case which you might be familiar with. But anyway, I mean, I bring a sports bag and put the baby in a sports bag and carry it off. I wouldn't be walking around the neighborhood with the baby. And then the baby had clothes on when it left the crib. Suppose they had a purple shirt, purple pants, and now it's running around in a diaper. Now there's claims. Here's some more interesting claims. All right. So there's another claim. Okay. So the baby's taken away. And the person took the baby, took the phones. And then they're thinking Jersey took the baby. So he called Megan, just, I guess, to tell her, hey, I got you a baby. But the phone call didn't go through. Now, mind you, Megan lived with like a whole bunch of people. And it was her phone. Um, it's She claims that her, the phone wasn't even in her possession, that maybe he was calling somebody else who had the phone in the house. But that's garbage, because why would he be calling somebody else and not her? I don't buy that. But on the other hand, if, if he was hanging out with her and people used her phone, maybe somebody was calling him for some drug connection because they thought, you know, that's, he didn't have a phone. So, so maybe they were calling her to hook up with him. So you see how this gets confusing. We don't know that anybody was calling Megan or that he was calling Megan. Somebody could have been calling him. Who knows? But so now we have this concept that, you know, he's taken the baby all right. So the, the next story about this whole thing is it gets very, very convoluted. Um, let's see if I can find the other piece here. All right. So now take a look at this. So now we have, okay. Uh, okay. Lisa's house is up on the left. You see Lisa's house way up on the left. And that's the red one. Now, the, then supposedly the witness house, that's somebody who saw a ba somebody with a baby there. Now you see the house that Jersey was working at is the yellow spot. So he's supposed to be working over there, but somehow he goes from that house he's working at, goes over to Lisa's house, takes the baby. Then he's walking back, you see. 
And then see the dumpster fire on the right? Somewhere around that whole time, there's a fire in a dumpster. And there's a theory that some baby clothes are burned up and that the dumpster was partway between the house he was working at and where Megan lived or used to live. So that's been all thrown into that too. And now he's had an arson charge before. And apparently Megan's car went up in flames at some point. So the theory is that he burned up her car. So now did he burn, start a dumpster fire with the baby's clothes? Okay, so the idea is that baby's wearing purple. So rather than have people see you carrying around a baby with purple clothes on that matches baby Lisa, you take the clothes off and burn it in the, and, and you burn it in the dumpster. And then he used an accelerant. So supposedly an accelerant, it was like a big fire. So now we have Jersey. Jersey decides for some reason it's still a baby and takes the phones and then tell, calls Megan to tell her, hey, I got you, baby. But he takes the clothes off the baby so it won't be recognized. And somehow he gets hold of a can of accelerant at the same time and then tosses the baby clothes in the thing and burns them up and then runs around with a naked baby. Um, three miles. He walks all over town for four or three hours because his baby's he's been taken by 11 p.m. and now he's out at 4 p.m. Five hours. He's wandering all over the neighborhood with a naked baby. Okay. It isn't a very good story. It isn't. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Now, is there another story that makes any better sense? I don't know. The problem is we've got this, this one phone call, which wasn't, didn't go through, but somebody who had the, the phone at the time it was Deborah Bradley's phone. Did Deborah Bradley make the phone call? We don't know. Uh, the claim is that Megan says she's never met the Bradleys, uh, Br Deborah Bradley or Jeremy Irwin. Uh, De Deborah Bradley and Jeremy Irwin said they they don't know who she is. Now, this dude has been all over the neighborhood, but apparently they claim they don't know him. I don't know. Is somebody not telling the truth? Is somebody actually buying drugs off this dude? I don't know. Does somebody know him that's they're not claiming they know him it, did deborah bradley have the phone and try to call him and got, you know the phone didn't work so she didn't get anybody i don't know i mean this is the problem we have a case where uh deborah bradley does not tell the truth she's changed her story a number of times enough to make the police suspicious she has a history of suspicious behavior but then we got this other suspect and he's got a massive history of suspicious behavior as well He's a creepy dude. <laughs> you know, he's got issues. And supposedly the phone call, the phone call that was attempted to be made was made to his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend. So you can't discount that either. And then there's this guy running around town with a naked baby. Now, is the naked baby just one of those red herrings that there's really some guy who just, you know, some guy took his baby and he was going someplace and he got seen by some people. And I don't know why the baby didn't have any clothes on you know, um, I don't know. No, now the 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 later sighting, the four fifteen sighting, said the guy had black. Uh, this, this guy saw the guy up close. The motorcycle man saw the guy with the baby up close, right? And he said he had uh, black salt and pepper hair, and it was at least enough he can comb through. This is Jer. Uh, this is um this guy Jersey. With see his extremely short hair, and when he's in court, he's got complete. He's most of the time completely bald. He's either bald, or he's got really short hair. He doesn't have salt and pepper hair that's longer. So if he didn't, this is why I think the police may have discounted him as being involved because they may have had these, these um, sightings and in neither sighting did the guy look like this guy. And if it didn't look like this guy, it wasn't this guy. It's, it's not like, it's not like Jersey showed up, stole the baby and put on a wig, you know, it's, an, it's unlikely to have happened. So this whole story, there's no proof that anybody broke into the house. It makes no sense that anybody turned the lights on to commit a crime why they would take the three phones doesn't even make sense some say oh to prevent them from calling 911 really i mean all you do is run to your neighbor's house and say call 911 it's not like it's gonna it's a one minute difference it's, it doesn't make any sense that's not reason to steal the three phones and then why are you stealing the baby for anyway <laughs> i mean and then you you just boldly go into the house and steal somebody's baby while the mother is there and even if she's been drinking you don't know she's so drunk she couldn't hear anything and there's two boys in the house maybe the husband's coming home 
this doesn't make any sense for anybody to abduct a baby. So I think the police are caught between a hard, uh, a rock and a hard place. They've got two, two, two suspects. They've got Deborah Bradley, who they don't, they don't believe is telling the truth. And they got this, this character. They say they have moved on from him. So maybe the police have a reason to have moved on from him. If they've moved on from him, I'm going to say they still think Debbie Bradley did it. I don't believe anybody else committed this. I mean, I don't believe another stranger came into the house and took the baby. So it's either this guy or it's not this guy. And if it's not this guy, it's Deborah Bradley. But I don't know enough of the inside information to figure out exactly what happened, who had the time to do things, what were the actual situations. I just know there's some suspicious people. And I can't go further than that because I don't have the inside information on it. Now, let me check some of your comments here. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa says, I think the sightings are totally unreliable. Well, I think they actually saw, I mean, there's two people who saw a man with a baby. I find that hard to discount because it's pretty weird. It's a weird sighting. It's not like, you know, you saw, oh, I saw a guy walking down the street, you know, that kind of sighting. I saw, I saw, but, oh, by the way, baby Lisa was supposedly seen this. Was, I forgot about this part of the story. Um, over in Greece, um, there, uh, there were some Romani people, um, which people call gypsies, uh, and they had a baby, a kid that looked like, that somebody claimed looked like Lisa, uh, for, like, as she been missing for three years or two years. She'd be three years old. They said, this kid looked like her. Uh, I didn't think so, but uh, the people said they had done a, um, a, 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 an adoption, kind of a you know, behind the scenes adop adop ad adoption adoption cell, I say. All right. What they did was it was this couple got this blonde kid from an, a woman who basically couldn't take care, take care of any more kids. So she sold them the kid, essentially. Um, it turned out not to be Lisa at all. It turned out to be a four-year-old, nothing to do with baby Lisa. And it was way over in Greece, for God's sakes. No, she, was, she wasn't kidnapped and taken to Greece. Uh, so that was just nonsense. Um, but she's never been found either. So either she's dead or she's I'm going to say she's, you know, chances of this character here, theoretically finding a way to sell the kid off and never being found again. I just don't, I, I don't buy that. So it's really weird. Um, let's see. Le okay. Did she, Carrie says, uh, did she report the missing phones to lead credence to the intruder theory? Possibly. Now the interesting, the intruder didn't take anything else, just the phones. So that is interesting. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> well, this one. Okay, Carrie, but what was her thinking? Somebody abducted my child and I can prove it because I took three cell phones. Well, no one said anybody's smart here. <laughs> this is the problem we have. A lot of people think that they'll say this. I think Deborah Bradley could have killed her kid, but I don't think she was smart enough to cover it up. That's what they think. And and maybe true. It also may be true that she just got lucky and she came up with some ideas and they worked. Who knows? I mean, um, it's hard to say. It really is. Maybe they say, well, if we get rid of the phones, uh, I don't know. Honestly, I don't, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, maybe she knew that, maybe she knew that maybe she didn't know her number or his number. She thought it was his number. She thought, well, if I just make, make that fake phone call, maybe they'll believe this guy's involved. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, <laughs> they might have might have been trying to get rid of evidence. Couldn't think of a better story. I don't know. I mean, that, that's why a lot of people think Deborah Bradley is not guilty because I think the story it would be too stupid. So this guy must be the guy. But then we come up with the issue of why is he kidnapping a baby and three cell phones? You know, it's just weird. Um, there's also there was a claim that whoever had the phones tried to check voicemail and go on the internet who would check the voicemail on a phone unless you were the owner of the phone that's another weird thing that makes very little sense um they were they were supposed all of them were non-functioning the only thing you could do was try to make a phone call that would register i guess that you were trying to make it but it wouldn't go through um you could somebody argued about the issue of calling 911. Supposedly they're saying you can make certain phones, even if they're non-functioning, you can do a 911 call. That was interesting. Um, uh, Deborah Bradley claims she does not do any drugs whatsoever. Do we believe that? 
again, this is where the police investigation would have to come find these things out. Just because somebody says they don't do something doesn't mean they don't do it. Apparently he was a big meth head, you know, so I'm going to say there may be a number of people around this, this, these two people here, since they live in a house of a bunch of people that have meth addictions. That would be my guess. Maybe she, maybe Deborah did have a connection. Now, the police have found out through the, the records. The records have proven that there has never been a phone call from Deborah's phone to either of these two people in a whole year. So that is in Deborah Bradley's favor, that there is no record of her calling these two people. So... So that's interesting. And, and, and that's, that, that is, uh, that's a, that's evidence and that's facts. So she may have no idea who these two people are and it may be true because they claim they don't know her and she claims she doesn't know them. And there's no cell phone records to prove that they ever had any connection. Now that doesn't mean this is where, this is where all the investigations get all tough. Doesn't mean she couldn't have, he's in the neighborhood. They couldn't have hung out had themselves a drink one day, be chatting. And he goes, Hey, you ever need something? Give me a ring. That could have happened. So, you know, the problem is when you get a lot of people acting squirrely and doing squirrely things, I mean, things happen and things can happen very quickly. I mean, I certainly know I've been around people who've handed me pieces of, you know, written their phone number down and handed it to me. People I don't even want to ever, ever contact have handed me. I'm like, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's say I didn't throw it away. Let's say I'm talking to somebody in my neighborhood. And they're a little sketchy. I have a little chat with them. They say, hey, you know, you know, just call me anytime you need something. They hand me that. I go home. I'm like, uh, and, and somebody calls at that moment. I pick up the phone and I drop that piece of paper on my bedside stand. Then the next day something happens. Terrible. Police come into my house. They look on my bedside stand. They're like, did you call the dude? <laughs> and you're like, oh crap. That I don't have anything to do with that guy. You know what? I, I just I was down. I was I was, I was standing there, just I was at a I don't know, a 7-Eleven, buying some stuff. The guy was outside. He just he handed me my his name and number. I put it in my pocket just so that you know he would think, you know, and get mad at me because I didn't want him to attack me. Got in the car, came home, emptied my pocket, threw everything on my I I have nothing to do with the dude. <sighs> Will the police believe me? Because I got that guy's phone number on my bed stand. See, that's where it gets really, really tricky. It's hard to know. <laughs> and he says, does one sell babies on eBaby? <laughs> you know, there might be a dark web thing called eBaby. That could that could be. Um, the uh, sniffer dogs, I assume they use them in the baby's room, Lisa. Uh, I do not think they hit in the baby's room. So, um so let's see what else we have here. Um, yes, the dog hit on the parents' room on the carpet. And I think there's one other place too, but I'm blanking on it. Um, uh, no, there were zero for forensics. I did look for footprints. I didn't see them. Um, apparently nothing, as far as I know. Um, let's see. <laughs> I don't think Bradley and Irwin are rocket scientists. I don't think so either, but you know, sometimes people get away with stuff, even if they're not smart. That's just a fact. And sometimes very smart people come up with a credible plan, but they make one mistake. So, you know, it can go either way. Um, it can go either way. Uh, Carrie says, I didn't know this case involved a literal dumpster fire. It did. It, it had, there was a dumpster fire and supposedly, supposedly, the question is, and again, we don't know the reality of this. Supposedly there was some burnt stuff that they showed the parents as if it were burnt baby clothes. And did they show burnt baby clothes to the parent, like Deborah Bradley, and say, did you burn up these baby clothes? There's a, it's a really sketchy story, and I just don't know the truth of it. So I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> I just don't know. Um, but if there was burnt baby clothes, first of all, if you put the baby clothes in there and you Here's what I don't have to understand. I'm going to burn up a couple pieces of baby clothes. First of all, when I put the accelerant in, I'm going to put the accelerant like on top of the baby, baby, baby clothes, you know, like soaked. Then I'm going to like the suckers. I'm going to make sure those things burn to, sh burn to smithereens. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let them be half burned. So what's the point? You know, 
So anyway, I don't even understand the whole dumpster fire thing at all. Um, I don't. Okay, let's see. Uh, Flor Florence says, if you want to drink all night, you might call a dealer to buy cocaine or speed, which will enable you to drink for longer. Possible. I mean, you know, you know, it's like one of the problems we have when people get involved with any kind of substance abuse is that sometimes people do stuff that is just, you know, spur of the moment, like, oh, that'll be cool, you know, and we don't believe it's true, but it is true. Um, so, yeah, people, you know, once they're a little happy, huh, shall we say, a little higher from whatever they're drinking or whatever they're doing. I, I, here's my problem with wine. I swear to God, this is true. Um, if we're you know, I'm going to go on a diet, right? And then I'm like, I was out working and stuff. And I like see this Italian restaurant. I think, okay, I'm going to go have myself just a glass of nice wine. I want something nice, but it's something simple. A glass of white wine and, and maybe a little, little salad. But once I drink the wine, then the bread looks really good. <laughs> and then the pasta comes. <laughs> you know? And then I'm like, because the wine does reduce that, you know, inhibition thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I think I'll just have the bread. And Dip it in olive oil. Oh, I'm sure so good, man. <laughs> and then uh, 2,000 calories later, you know, I'm like, damn it, I shouldn't have had that glass of wine. One glass of wine does me, does me in just like that. So, you know, what happens if you have more glasses of wine? Then maybe you get into some other like alcohol. Maybe you start doing some other drugs. You just don't know. And just because, and I know people will say, well, you know, I've, I've, I've had problems with um, addiction in my life. And let me tell you, Pat. This isn't the way it works. I did this and blah, blah, blah. People do this. It's not always true. Just because you do something a certain way doesn't mean the next person does it the same exact way. So we have to take everything and understand that people have their own weirdo behaviors. Um, Lisa says, these cases where the babies go missing are all suspicious. Many have parallels. Several of the cases, the child is the youngest in the family. Correct. Well, two. Well, Lisa was the youngest in the family. Uh, the little, the other little baby, Harmony, was also the youngest. Uh, Madeline McCann was the oldest because she had two younger siblings. Um, but I would say this: in a lot of times, in general, um, babies are more annoying. <laughs> you know, they're a lot more work, and people sometimes when they have them, they're just overburdened and they just they don't, can't deal with it. Maybe the older child they can deal with because they can tell the child to go play, but you can't tell that with a little baby. So yeah, sometimes I think it's just difficult for babies. Babies are quite often victims and just in general, especially of, of like boyfriends and stepfathers, because you know, especially if you don't have the love for the kid, when, when you're taking care of a baby, the baby just cries and is annoying. And you know, it doesn't have to that person who doesn't love it. It doesn't have a lot of personality. It's just a crying little thing. And you know, just really annoying. And so they, He's easier to kill too. You know, putting a pillow over them or something. It's just easier. Easier to kill them, easier to get angry over them. Yeah. So small ones definitely have problems. Um, let's see. Um, really, Doreen, that's interesting. The parents held vig vigils outside their home for years. My friend had gone and talked to them. They did, but they also got tired of the vigils outside their homes and they told people to go away. They were saying that after a while, it was an you know, and I, I kind of agree with this, that they're they, you know, they couldn't have a, they couldn't go on with their other children and have any kind of a normal life when you have people constantly standing outside your home having vigils. And they got annoyed and told the people to go away. And some people didn't take that well. And I, I kind of don't blame them on that one. Um, all the suspects are small, medium time crooks. Everyone has something to hide. Even if it's small, it changes the story enough you never get the truth. Yeah, you know, and that's tough because one thing I've always pointed out is that. Sometimes the problem with small time crooks, drug users, uh, drug dealers, psychopaths, is you never know if they're lying to get out of trouble or they're lying themselves into trouble because they lie so much that they keep, oh, I better cover that up. But they may not be covering up this that they're doing. They just may be covering up that that they're doing. So you don't know where the problem really comes in. Is Are they trying to come up, cover up something different than you think they're trying to cover up because they just don't want to get into some other kind of trouble? And that can be very, very true. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. I, 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 I go against this. The police are either corrupt. No. And they seem to think they know. Um, 
again, corrupt is rare. I mean, I, I'm not saying there aren't police who are corrupt. There's no reason for the police to be corrupt in this case. They got, they, there's no reason for them to be. I mean, unless somebody in their family was involved in a, uh, whatever, some big mayor or somebody was involved in something. No, I mean, most of the time the police are not corrupt. Usually they're working very hard to solve the case. And they have a lot of pressure on them. They do their best. And a lot of times you just can't prove it. And that's the problem. Sometimes you're just not talented. You know, you don't have the skill. And therefore, you're not successful at, at the crime. You go the wrong direction and you just the crime just, you know, you don't get the evidence and then you screw the crime up. So incompetence is more likely than corruption. Uh, and most of, and even over incompetence is that the crime is just difficult to solve. And there's a lot of people who are just lucky and getting away with crimes. That's a fact. And I think we can't, we shouldn't go away from the fact that people, the luck is there because when, when, some, when a crime is committed, uh, you know, it's 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 an unplanned, uh, it's planned or unplanned. But when a crime is committed, nobody else expects it. So there's a time frame, which is available for evidence to be gotten rid of, for stories to be created, for weather to destroy stuff, uh, and then when it gets to the police, for the police, uh, whoever detective you happen to get, it's a crapshoot. You get a great detective. You get a guy who's been there for a week. You know, you get witnesses who don't claim they saw things they didn't see, things get confused, the media causes trouble. So getting away with a crime can simply be because it can be a whole pile of, of such a mess that it just can't ever be prosecuted. And that's, that's the way it can go when it's a difficult crime. Um, where could the body or the baby be? I'm going to say the baby. I don't know. But uh, one of the problems with babies is that they're, easy, they're easier to hide than big people. And that's a fact. I mean, you know, you got a you got a 200 pound body, or you got a little little 15 pound body. A lot easier to hide, a lot easier to dispose of. Um, don't know, but many many children's bodies have not been found who've gone missing. So Sabrina Eisenberg's body has not been found. Uh, Madeleine McCann's body has not been found. Baby Lisa's body has not been found. Nor have their, nor have the live versions of these three children been found. Uh, or uh, let's see what else do who else do we have? We also have um a uh, 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 gosh, I'm just I'm just gonna okay, somebody somebody named some more ba children have gone missing whose body bodies and or live haven't been found. Um who else who else we got here? I guess it's interesting how many haven't been found. People don't realize. Uh Kyron? Uh oh and what's his name? And uh oh my god, the 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 Australian kid, um, he hasn't been found. And also, oh, I'm just blanking. I'm blanking. I've done all the shows too. Okay, Summer Okay, Summer Wells is one. Okay, that's one. Um, Dior, Dior has not been found. That's correct. I've done, I've done the shows on both of those. And I'm just blanking on their names. Yeah, see? Where are they? Where are all those little babies? Who? I do not know that one, Doreen. That's a, that's one I'm not not familiar with. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, they've never. They, well, they've never found. They've never found Sabrina. They have never found Sabrina. Uh, uh, okay, Doreen says I don't want to take away from Pat's take. That's eh, okay. But I think there's more than one psychopath in the mother's family. <laughs> um, that family had problems. Her mother. Her mother. I think there were. Her family, if you look into it, her family history is a mess. Yeah, she she didn't grow up with a great family. Let's put it that way. And if the uncle who was saying that is like, this is going to end well. That's what the uncle said. This I know the family. It's not going to end well. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the family, it, it's not a healthy family. That is, that is very true. Um, so, yeah. But again, you know, it, but then again, if you take a look at, a, a, you know, the other suspect in the case, you know, he doesn't have a healthy family either, probably. So that's the problem. You get a whole bunch of mess. And then you try to figure out who, who could have done it. How did they get away with it? Why did they do it? And, but um, I don't know. Uh, the police, I believe are, oh, really? Is that, oh, is that right? Doreen says her mother was found dead by her brother on his 10th birthday. Oh, that's lovely. 
Lovely. And so alcoholism runs in the family too. And, and I believe that uh, Deborah keeps trying to say she doesn't drink that much, but then she claims how much she does drink. And it's not normal the amount that she says she drinks without, you know, probably being alcoholic. Um, and I think sometimes people can over, you know, say people are alcoholics just because they have, a, you know, a couple of drinks on Wednesday and a couple of drinks on Friday. And, you know, they say, oh, that person is an alcoholic. Or they have one drink a day. They're an alcoholic. I, I think sometimes it can be overdone. But when a person says they get blind drunk more than twice a week when they have children, I'm going to say you might have a problem. Um, might Oh, yeah. Haley Cummings. There's another one. I'm going to do a Haley Cummings show at some point because that's a whole really interesting, really interesting one. Um, yes, I think that's true, Deborah. Mon I think she does minimize her drinks. Um, oh, uh, Annika says, in my defense, <laughs> my point was that, P oh, police are rarely corrupt. And I, so I don't think they are. I think they think they know, but can't prove. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I read that wrong. But uh, I, I point that out because so often people, the minute that something doesn't go well with the case, they go, it's police corruption. And I get so frustrated because once in a while it is. But most of the time it isn't. And I will be I will be willing to stand up for when I think something is crooked. Believe me, I stand up for that. Um, but this case, yeah. But that's correct. I think I think the fact they keep saying that they don't think that Jersey is the guy that moved away from him makes me wonder what they have on Deborah Bradley. Because they keep I, for 10 years, I don't think they've ever taken their focus off of her. Now they could be wrong. This is also a possibility. Sometimes you can get uh, tunnel vision. And she just irked the heck out of them. They didn't believe her. And then they just discounted Jersey. And they said, oh, that phone call. Don't know what it means. So I'm just going to ignore the phone call. They could have done that. They thought it was nonsensical that Jersey would take a kid and just dump that idea. And therefore, maybe they are looking at Deborah when they should be looking at Jersey. I don't know. But as I say, I'm not on the inside of the investigation. So I can't see these specific issues. But... Um, I just, I, the phone call is the only thing that stands out to me that makes me go, could, could Jersey have something to do with this? But I can't understand why he'd come into a home, turn on all the lights, steal three cell phones, go, go, go get a baby for no reason. It doesn't even make sense to me because it's not the 10 month old child is not in, it's not like he's targeting her for, uh, you know, older children, six year old, it might be a sexual you know, sexual predator, child sexual predator. That's teenagers, definitely. But 10 month old baby, you usually don't break into somebody's house to steal a 10 year old baby, a 10 month old baby. It just, it's, it's just so weird. I can't, I can't come up with it. Um, the other possibility is, and nobody talks about this possibility is just because her friend went home doesn't mean that Deborah couldn't have had somebody come else come over after that point. Like, for example, maybe she didn't know Jersey. Maybe Jersey came over to the house, they hung out. I did. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying we just don't know. I don't have. There's no video. There's no CCTV. I don't know. So, so it's, it's it is a little bit frustrating. Um. So, uh, Doreen says, one thing that saddened nobody in the family ever checks on the police progress. Really? Uh, I didn't. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it's been ten years. Um. I mean, I've seen things that say, you know, we hope she's still alive. We, you know, blah, blah. But uh, I, you know, I don't know. Um, when would they have hidden the body? Did the father help? Were the work times checked? Seems like she would need help. I don't know. This is, this is a frustrating thing, Elizabeth. As I said, I don't know. When the father suddenly had to go to work that one day and do this job, I can't seem to get information that he was um, proven to be at that location from the time he said he was till the time he came home. I don't have any proof of that. I don't know that we, what time he actually came home. He says he came home at, did he come home at that time? Did they, I don't know. He did have a work phone. Did the, did they GPS the work phone and be able to ping where he was at? Um, apparently the phones that were stolen, the one that was, they were never more than like a quarter of a mile away from the house. So they didn't even move out of the area. So, Oh, there's another interesting inform piece of information. Um, uh, supposedly, yeah, they were very close. The, the phone that was taken, they pinged until it stopped. At some point, either somebody drowned the phone or took the battery out. I don't know. But it didn't seem to ping very far from the area. So, again, if we had a guy walking a baby three miles away, would that phone have been with him? 
would that have pinged over there? I don't know. Um, I just don't know what Jeremy Irwin's, uh, I don't know how well they locked down his movements. I just don't know. And just because Deborah says she was asleep at 1030 doesn't mean she was asleep at 1030 either. See, none of these things are proven. We don't know what Deborah uh, Bradley's behavior was that entire night after her friend left. We have zero proof of what she did that entire the rest of the night. Um, we don't. We'd have zero proof of anything. And we have zero proof on Jeremy Irwin, as far as I know. But maybe the police do have more information on him that he was seen at work or he, because it was some job he was doing. I don't think it was actually, I think he was fixing something. So I think he was on his own. I don't know they had to clock in or anything. So unless the phone proved where he was, I don't know. Um, again, he could have left his phone someplace at work, got in the car, driven away, done something, came back, picked up the phone and then went home. I, I don't know. You know, he could have come home at two o'clock in the morning and had two hours to do something and then said, oh, I got home at four. We don't know. That's a, that's a whole bunch of stuff that's just missing. We don't have proof on where Jersey was. Did Jersey, maybe he had an alibi. Maybe that's why the police discounted it. Maybe he had an alibi this whole damn time. And we're thinking Jersey did it, but he was someplace that people said, no, he was here all night long. We, For some reason in this case, we don't seem to have very much information. I don't know why it's so, it's so hidden in this case, because it's very unusual to have so little to go on. But yeah, where was Deborah all that night? Do we have any proof? Where was Jeremy Irwin all that night? Do we have any proof? Where was Jersey all that night? Do we have any proof? And I don't think we have, I don't have anything on any of them. So that's kind of drives me. Uh, the, okay, let's see. They have an alibi for him. So they say, <laughs> they don't reveal what it is. Yeah. So, I mean, if they have an alibi, of course, what is an alibi? I was with my drunk buddies. Uh, I was with my new girlfriend. I was with my mommy. I mean, no, those are never good alibis. But did he have a real alibi? And if he had a real alibi, then they know it's not him. That would be that simple. And they also, the descriptions don't seem to match uh, Jersey. The description of the guy running around with the baby. Um, so did they more match Jeremy Irwin or did they not match him either? So I don't know. Uh, or it had nothing to do with the baby. It, it wasn't baby Lisa. It was just some freaky red herring, you know? Uh, I don't know. And it's one of these cases where I'd love to know the answer to, but because I have not enough information, I can't come to a conclusion. All I can say is, we have two possible suspects and both of them have some squirrely behaviors that we can't seem to pin down at this point. Um, so that's very frustrating. Um, let's see what else anybody has to say here. Let's see. Um, oh, you're talking about the and indigenous children. Um, uh, they weren't ingenious, but they were indigenous. <laughs> In May 2021, 215 remains of indigenous children were found buried in unmarked graves near residential school near the city of Kamloops Indian Residential School. This is this is a case up, I believe that was a case in Canada, um, if I'm in the correct place here. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a whole there's a whole issue about that's a whole another whole thing I'm not probably going to get into because that becomes a very political historical thing about how children were taken away from their, their, their indigenous families. The children were taken to schools and there was a lot of, you know, kind of a unfortunate situation. And then these a bunch of children were buried there. And the question is where they buried because they died of, uh, you know, diseases that were endemic at the time or were they murdered? Um, so that's a huge, a huge kettle of worms that I, as a probably a little bit more than I want to deal with on one of these shows, but it is a fascinating thing. If you want to look it up, it's, it's, it's very sad. And uh, the question is what actually happened and, you know, and it's hard to figure out because uh, history is always a little sketchy and, you know, so, but it's, it's quite, quite fascinating. Um, uh, no, okay. I'm looking at the FBI side of kidnappings and missing persons. So many, so many. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of missing missing children are simply being with 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 a parent that's not supposed to have them, um, and they just haven't relocated them. Uh, but when we're talking about, you know, the children have gone missing and never been found, literally have never been found because they've been quote kidnapped or some or the parent did them in. 
It's amazing. Um, there's more than we think, and uh, so more get away with it than we think, and it, it's it's pretty it's pretty sad. But you know, we we wonder how can you not find that body? But you know, decomposition is is a thing, and if you put the body in the right place, decomposition happens, and then animals can just you know just destroy all this whole skeleton and crush it up, and who knows? You know, it's or it just is in a place that's so inaccessible nobody ever finds it. It's really hard to say. Um, that's why sometimes they, they did look through um, they did look through a dump site um, because they were they were thinking that maybe you know the uh, I think this is a picture of that yeah there they are um, they thought maybe the bo bo baby was dumped you know and you know, tr trash you know where the trash goes and that's a good way to get rid of a body but they didn't find anything over there so again we're not sure uh, what happened um, oh. The father, the father alibi is what reminded me of Haley Cummings because they knew dad Ron was at work because he clocked in and out. Oh yeah. The new part. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do the Haley Cummings case because that's not exactly necessarily true. Necessarily. So shall I put it that way? So I have a strong opinion on the Haley Cummings case and who's involved in it and how it went down. Uh, I just haven't thought about it in years and haven't talked about it in years, but I will do the Haley Cummings case because I have a, a large file on that. And uh, I did do a lot of um, speaking out on that case. Um, and so Ron is not your Mr. Innocent. That's all I can say. He is. <laughs> yeah. Difficult to find a baby in a landfill. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why landfills are used for getting a, a little bit getting rid of a lot of things and people. Um, so it's, um, oh, it's way horrible to say, but if the baby was killed and put in a dumpster overnight or early morning, they're often emptied at five or six. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we don't know is if somebody got in a vehicle and drove the baby. So this is why I'm trying, I wonder what, what happened with the CCTV thing. Did anybody check any cameras any place? Because let's say something went wrong. The baby died in the house. And Deborah was not so drunk she couldn't get up and do something about it. Um, did, could she just pick up the baby, take it out of the house, take it someplace far away and throw it in and throw it somewhere in a trash bin? And likewise for Jeremy and likewise for uh, um, Jersey. Did he take the baby and say, well, that was stupid as crap. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know why I did that. And then also possible. So don't know. Or was there enough time for, you know, in a, in a period of time to drive someplace and bury the child in a, in a shallow grave somewhere? Uh, who knows? I mean, we just don't know because I don't know what the movements of everybody really was. And that's frustrating to me. Maybe the police do know what the movements were and they're just not telling us. And But it's been over 10 years and it's when it gets to over 10 years, you kind of think this isn't going well. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going well. Oh, is that true? I did not know that, Christine. The Irwin home is less than a mile from the Missouri River. Well, there you go. That's another possibility that, you know, nothing like a river. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I wish I, had, I wish I had a better answer for you in this case. But it's, uh, you know, all I could do is come up with um, the information that I did have and could find. And, um, yeah, so I, I will try. I will see if Ron Rugen will come on because uh, I know he worked on this case for so long. I'd love to have a conversation with him and go back over some of this. And I said, I don't usually do this kind of thing, but I think it'd be fun because um, I'm curious. I, I, I kind of think I remember what he thinks, but, <laughs> but it's been so many years. I mean, that we've talked about the Lisa Irwin case that I may be misremembering or you know, may, maybe I'm not, but. I'd love to talk to him again and see what he has to say. Uh, well, see, that's the problem. Lisa, I, I can't go there. I can't go there because, okay, here, here's, the, here's the thing I try not to do. If I'm a YouTuber, <clears throat> just a, a regular YouTuber who is not a criminal profiler, I could say, you know what I think? I think this is, I'm more leaning toward that. And I think this happened because I'm not putting my professionalism on the line. I'm just giving an opinion as a lay person, but I am a professional and I do not have the evidence strong enough for me. I just don't 
to say, I believe Deborah Bradley is guilty or I believe Jersey is guilty. I don't have enough evidence. I have suspicions about their behaviors, but I, the evidence is so weak and it's so missing. I just, I, I honestly can't, I can't do any more than to tell you what I, what we have as information and why the information is, you know, what information is reasonable and what information we should question and, and where it leaves us and where it leaves us is I think the police have more information that we do not know. And if I knew that information, then I might be able to say, in my opinion, as a criminal profile, the evidence supports this, but I don't have enough. I really just don't have enough. So I can't, <laughs> I can't because I wouldn't feel comfortable at this point uh, saying that. So yes, I think it's quite a mystery case because we don't have enough information. Um, yeah, I just don't. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, that, I do have an opinion on that case. <laughs> when I do Haley Cummins, Cummings, you will hear my opinion on that case because in the Haley Cummings case, there's enough evidence for me to say what I believe it, the evidence supports. Just this case, not so much. Really not so much. I, yeah, I would say this. Um, I have a hard time understanding why Jersey, although he might be a psychopath, I might be because he's a criminal and he's a, you know, kind of a guy who seems to have issues. Let's say, let's say Jersey's a psychopath. He just does weird shit. Um, maybe just maybe he uh, rolled into the house and did stuff that makes no sense. Maybe, but it's, it's not a very, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Let me put it that way. He could have. It just makes not a lot of sense. The only thing that is confusing is the fact that that phone call did go to his girlfriend. And that's, it, it didn't go to his girlfriend, but that phone call was attempted to be made to his girlfriend. And you wonder why that would happen if, 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 if Deborah Bradley knew nothing of him or the girl and Jeremy Irwin knew nothing of him or the girl, why did that phone, why was that number even made? You know, why, why would that call even be attempted by them if they didn't know who they were. So that's that's the biggest like fly in the ointment that puts Jersey into the picture at all. Um, and then of course people saying they saw a guy walking around the neighborhood with a, with a baby and a, and a diaper, which is, that is also very confusing because we don't know <clears throat> if that guy has anything to do with the kidnapping, you know? And then we have, we have Deborah Bradley's very bizarre behavior, her changing of stories, which may be just to protect her own bad mothering, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and she has a questionable past. And I, I, that's why I started out with the Madeline McCann to the Harmony case, to her case, because she was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, when that case went down. And there's people from Fort Bragg who's like, I don't want anything to do with her anymore. She's a manipulative, lying, whatever. Uh, and her own, her own mother-in-law didn't throw her out of her house. So she's got questionable behaviors along with high alcohol drinking. Uh, and so did she do something? And, you know, and, you know, generally speaking, these cases, usually a case of a child, a baby, this kind of thing happening to a baby, usually the parents are involved in one way or the other. Um, so I, if you're going to weigh things out, I'd say things point more toward Deborah Bradley than they do toward Jersey. But that's all I could ever say. Uh, and because I don't have enough evidence to go further than that. So. Yeah. I wish I did have more. I, I'd like to know. <laughs> I wish I knew what the police knew. That would be great. So anyway, uh, that's it for tonight. Um, so it's an interesting case. I'm glad I got to even look at it. And I'm, I'm going to contact Ron Rugen and see if we can do a, a get together with that. And uh, I am working on the Jack the Ripper issue. Uh, now that I'm home again, and can focus on it. Uh, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing the, uh, the whole thing on Jack the Ripper. And um, I'm not sure what I'm doing next week, but we will definitely have a hangout this week. And maybe I'll have the phone in, a phone in as well, but I have to get everything in gear and plan everything. So um, <laughs> I'm most welcome, Christine. Well, thank, and thank you, Lisa. Um, so anyway, again, if you're still here and you've never subscribed to the channel, do that, please. Uh, join Patreon and see, I have great people here. I just, I love all my people in my, uh, in my chat room. And I'm always missing the people who can't make it because you know, I, I know that this, 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 uh, this, um, 
Uh, th thank you. Thank, thank you, Ann. And thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Lisa S. My candor. Well, you know, I try to be truthful, even if I, you know, sometimes if I, I can only go as far as I can go and I try to be straightforward with what I know, because I'm trying again, this is an educational channel. I'm trying to teach people about profiling and evidence. I'm not trying to prove how brilliant I am, although I am. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Doreen, <laughs> and good night, Anne. Um, again, uh, so yeah, if you haven't joined, join my people here, join Patreon, and uh, yes, and I'm sorry, all you guys who are going to be at three, I was going to do this earlier, so I lost all my UK people, and my people from Europe, and uh, and uh, Lisa Ann had to disappear because she had to go to work, so sorry, guys, uh, I had to move the, the show, so, but duty called, so anyway, look forward to seeing you sometime during the week. Uh, if you're a part of Patreon. And if not, you can still watch all my shows. They're all available to everybody because I want everybody to learn, even if they don't, aren't able to help out. Oh, there's a dollar sign below too. You can click that. You can help that way. <laughs> See you next time.